Uh, so Nuo is an assistant professor in chemistry and biomedical engineering at Carnegie Mellon uh, in Pittsburgh. And uh, he got his undergraduate at Illinois in chemistry. And I'm not going to read the dissertation because it's very boring and he's doing much more cooler stuff. Than that. <laughs> and then his PhD at Berkeley in chemistry in another boring stuff, which I'm going to skip as well. Uh, but he received an NRC uh, postdoctoral fellowship and went to work with the polymers group at NIST and became a leader for the group uh, polymers at NIST. And that's how we met. He invited me to go out there. And after missing about 15 planes, I think I made it and had <laughs> talked to his wife yeah, on the yeah. phone for I don't know how long. So it was, it was, it was you, very fun. He won our Iron Man award. Yeah, so we, I, mean, I made it and I uh, had a great visit and we've continued interacting since. And since he always gave me a hard time, I have to give him a hard time. So now I have this poster <laughs> that uh, we made at advertising your seminar. Uh, mm -hmm. You're going to take it back to you on the plane like this. <laughs> and, the panel, and when you're carrying it through security, <laughs> uh, with it, okay? So that's all you gain. I will immerse you for the for the day. <laughs> so with that, uh, it's a pleasure to have Noah, and we're looking forward to your talk. Okay. Thanks, Andres. Appreciate the uh, invitation to come Kill come visit. Uh, sorry, let you do that. Yes. How's that? Perfect. Okay. All right. Um, so let's see if I can get my everything. Uh, coordinated here. So uh, I'm obviously not going to spend a lot of time on this introductory slide, but um, it's basically just to, uh, making the point that um, we've been thinking a lot about uh, function, uh, structure function issues for in tissues and how we can engineer materials um, to promote repair processes. Um, and so I used uh, the, the lining of the intestine here as just an example to talk about this triumvirate that we love talking about in tissue engineering of cells, matrix, and soluble signaling molecules. Um, so if we look at the um, sort of if we look at the extracellular matrix and how it's been used as sort of inspiration for developing um, functional materials in biomedical applications, um, sort of on the on the bottom here, um, I've got I've got shown more um, sort of mechanical or structural variables as far as um, so like osmotic pressure, modulus, etc. Um, and then on the top, I have sort of more biochemical variables. And Andreas has done a lot of nice work looking at cell adhesion. Um, and then there's been a lot of, uh, you know, obviously considerable interest in um, delivering exogenous growth factors uh, to sites where you're trying to crank up a repair process. So the idea here is that we've got soluble signaling proteins that pack a punch. And um, what we want is we want to add more of them to drive some, some process. So there are two main strategies that are used. One is, is the um, uh, uh, the sort of delivery process where you have a degrading polymer that releases um, uh, a, a therapeutic protein. And then the other option is actually just covalently attaching it to a material um, and presenting it that way. And so in both these cases, we're adding more. So what we wanted to do in my group um, is actually ask the question, well, what if we had a material that could take things away rather than add them? Um, so our extracellular matrix is the prime uh, regulator, post-transcriptional regulator of the activities of soluble signaling proteins. And, and the way that we think about it is so we've got our sort of schematic of like a collagen uh, fiber. And here's a cell, and here's a soluble signaling protein. And so there's a competition for the soluble signaling protein between the cell receptors and the matrix. And so the idea is that if the matrix wins out, this can get uh, sequestered in here, sometimes in an active form, sometimes in an inactive form. And if it doesn't interact very much, then it's free to, to target receptors on the cell. And so we, what we wanted to do was just engineer matrices, materials that can perform the same function. Um, but the question is, how do we do that? So um, we've, we wound up, so we wanted to study ways the materials could promote tissue repair. And so we originally were thinking a lot about growth factors, like everyone else. Um, um, but uh, af after working on it for a while, what we realized is that we actually need to start thinking a lot more about inflammation, um, sort of the, early, the front end of the repair process. So this is a diagram from uh, a review that came out in New England Journal of Medicine um, um, on wound healing. And so this is, this is skin where we've had um, an injury. And um, uh, so in a healthy adult, you'll form a blood clot within 20 seconds. It's composed of fibrin and, and pl uh, activated platel clumps of activated platelets. Um, and then for a few days, while, while that injury is red um, and inflamed, you've got um, 
cells crawling around the extracellular matrix that are trying to scavenge, um, uh, they're trying to eat bacteria that got in, they're trying to eat dead tissue, etc. Um, so. <clears throat> Later on, what happens is that this is the system is going toward a repair process, and you'll, you'll actually be forming new matrix. But early on, what um, they're, you're basically setting the stage for for what happens later. And so, what we wanted to be able to do is basically um, the, so the cells that are that are present at this injury site are um, their activities are determined by the um, a host of soluble signaling proteins um, that are basically giving them instructions. And so, while the, all these GFs are growth factors, and while in the review they talk mostly about growth factors. The reality is that day three, the molecules that are doing most of the work are pro-inflammatory cytokines. And the cells that, um, that we are particularly interested in are macrophages because they're involved in the front end of the process and eating stuff, but then they're also the ones that later on um, are actually setting the stage for um, you know, revascularization, new matrix, um, matrix depositing cells, yeeps, um, et cetera. That looks good. Um, oh, let's stop that. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Um, um, yeah. I, anyway, I've, I've I've gotten to the point now where my the students in my class are I think are passing a hat around to buy me a new computer. <laughs> you need Windows Seven. <laughs> That's exactly what I need. <laughs> That'll be the uh, the that was a joke from a Mac user. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be the the final bullet for this computer. <laughs> so the idea is what we want to do is we want to be able to add a material here that would indirectly control the activities of these cells by controlling what soluble signaling proteins they would see. Um, and the idea is that if we can change what happens at the beginning of the inflammatory response, we're hoping that we can actually shift the final outcome of the, in the repair process. That's the hope, at least. Um, there's actually a lot of, there have been a lot of studies where matrix biologists have studied the interactions of growth factors um, with uh, the extracellular matrix and there are all sorts of heparin binding domains, etc. Um, that cause all sorts of interactions. And so, like in the case of wound healing, uh, when you have activated platelets at an injury site, they're dumping out large quantities of platelet derived growth factor, which gets sequestered in the matrix and then are used um, much later on, you know, five days later when you're actually ready to start doing the repair. Um, those get released when um, the fibrin matrix gets broken down. The thing with most cytokines is that they are, for, for most of them, they're, um, uh, their interactions with the extracellular matrix tend to be fairly weak. Um, and this was actually what we were originally studying in my lab. Um, and uh, it, in, from a certain perspective, it's not very interesting because you just don't, they, most, many of the pro-inflammatory cytokines just diffuse through the matrix like it's just buffer. Um, and so the, from a functional perspective, this probably makes sense because um, the idea is that the, the, what the cytokines are doing is they're basically like a messenger um, and they're produced in response to certain stimuli, injured tissue, um, um, infections, etc. And there's no reason for that message to be delayed. You, when you send it out, you want it to make it to the other cells in the area. And so, our most of our, we, what we think is that a lot of our, our cytokines are actually have actually evolved to have weak interactions with the matrix because of this. Um, and so, what that means is that. If it's not if it's not something that's regulated strongly by a native matrix, if you have an artificial matrix that will do that will play this role and um, uh, and interact strongly with them, you could in principle see a big effect um, uh, if you uh, target the right mediators okay. and design your materials the right way. And so that's eventually what I'm going to tell you about. Thank you for your patience. Um, so <clears throat> um, we've been doing a lot of work looking at. Um, uh, the macrophage is actually going to be the cell that we're using as a marker for how active our materials are. Um, and so macrophages have this sort of Jekyll and Hyde um, uh, personality where early in the inflammatory response they adopt a phenotype which is referred to as M1. Um, and so this is the sort of angry terminator type macro, um, phenotype where they're releasing pro-inflammatory signals, they're breaking down matrix, um, and they're contributing to pathogen resistance. And so this is, they adopt this phenotype under um, the influence of soluble mediators like interleukin 1 beta, tumor necrosis factor alpha, and members of the interferon family. Um, 
late in the inflammatory response, what happens is they shift gears and they adopt the, and it, what's called an M2 phenotype, which is um, under, these, uh, under these mediators, members of the interleukin family, glucocorticoids, et cetera. Um, and at this point, they're releasing like proangiogenic factors, they're recruiting fibroblasts, um, uh, and they're leading to a Th2 type um, uh, immune response. And so, um, in, so the community that's probably studied macrophage biology the most is actually the cancer community. Um, so they, so in our tum in tumors, um, we have a lot of resident macrophages, and they all the tumor somehow convinced them to adopt this M2 phenotype. And what they're doing is they're actually releasing um, molecule these all these molecules here fuel the growth of the tumor. And so what cancer biologists would love to do is turn these macrophages back into M1 macrophages. But for what we've been doing in thinking about controlling inflammatory responses is is for conditions where you have an over-exuberant inflammatory response that's actually leading to continued tissue damage, we'd actually like to put the brakes on this process and ideally guide them over toward this a little bit early. The, the basic thinking is that like 100,000 years ago, if I'm out in the jungle and I get cut, this could be a life-threatening event because we didn't have soap, you know, we didn't know about antiseptic techniques, etc. And so, um, uh, our immune systems have evolved to have a very strong response every time the skin is broken um, and that the, the fastest way to protect that is to um, ultimately winds up forming scar tissue. Um, so what we're um, uh, what we'd like to do is find ways of modulating um, macrophage phenotype with materials. Okay. So um, the kinds of conditions that we are looking at at this point are not the sort of classical like tissue engineering type treatments in terms of like bone, cartilage, etc. We're really, we've really gotten much more focused on conditions, like I said, that involve a lot of inflammation and where the inflammation is actually causing further tissue damage. And so a great example of this that I'll talk about later is actually burns. Um, and so what we'd like to be doing in a lot of these conditions is um, we'd like to manage the inflammatory response locally um, to avoid these sort of systemic, um, to avoid systemic immune responses. So um, this is the point of the, the talk where everyone gets disappointed because they get you've been you know you're excited you think this is an important problem this guy's going to come up with a really slick solution and what you see here is a high molecular weight hydrophilic polymer where I've covalently attached an antibody that targets specific mediators of inflammation like cytokines and that's basically it um, and so <clears throat> the 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 thinking here is <clears throat> we've got. So antibodies are, have been developed to specifically bind and in some cases neutralize certain proteins like cytokines. And so we have commercially available ones that I'll talk about later um, for, all sorts of, um, for all sorts of cytokines. Um, and so what we want to do is we wanted to, what we're doing is we're attaching it to this, this big polymer. And so the idea is that by attaching it to a big hydrophilic polymer, it will stay where I put it. And so in a sense, it is kind of like a tissue engineering approach in terms of thinking locally. But the idea is that um, we're actually just interested in modulating immune responses. Um, so we've chosen hyaluronic acid for a couple of reasons. Um, this is the polymer that I'll talk about for most of, of the talk. So it's a naturally occurring glycosaminoglycan. Um, so the interesting thing about HA is that it's so it has this um, <clears throat> fairly monotonous repeat sequence. Um, uh, when it, in the high molecular weight form, it's recognized by certain receptors like CD44, and what it does is it upregulates um, cell motility, which is important in wound healing responses because you want to get your repair cells moving in more quickly. However, when it gets chopped down, chopped into little pieces, either through oxidative stress or um, enzymatically, the degradation products themselves are immunologically active. Um, they're known as damage-associated molecular patterns, and so this is part of how your immune system looks for problems at the sites of injury because we have this in practically all of our tissues and so when this gets broken down it's a sign that there was a problem and so this in some in a lot of fairly complicated ways uh, involves your innate immune system um, in responding to uh, in responding to injuries. So what we're doing by attaching this antibody to it is um, so hyaluronic acid by itself has weak or no interactions with most pro-inflammatory cytokines um, and so what we're doing is we're giving this sort of giving the material sort of a new dimension of biological activity um, and we're also localizing the effects of the antibody. Okay. So, um, and I should mention, so hyaluronic acid, one reason why we're 
we're mostly looking at dermatological applications right now. Hyaluronic acid has been shown to be effective at promoting healing of diabetic foot ulcers. Um, uh, people with um, sickle cell anemia also have non-healing wounds, um, and it's it's actually worked well for that. And so, you know, if nothing else, we'll hopefully make it work a little bit harder. Um, um, the the way we make these the base material is is simple. Um, basically, we do a carbodiamide coupling to one of these carboxy one of the you know four thousand carboxylic acid groups along the backbone of the hyaluronic acid. Um, so we have a we've developed a standard purification. Um, Pro protocol and we've analyzed the composition with polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis and ELISA. Um, um, so this was um, so a lot of this work was pioneered by my first two graduate students. So Sidi Ben Sharif uh, just finished his PhD in chemistry um, in May. He's now postdocing at Harvard with Dave, Mo Dave Mooney and Dave Edwards and. And Steve Sun is a grad student in biomedical engineering who's still with me. So, um, so this is a picture of the purified gel um, that we after precipitation. These are Steve's fingertips. So you see that we're not exactly in mass production mode yet, um, but we can reproducibly make compositions around this around this range where um, every one in every seven chains has got an antibody on it. So this is what the page data look, look like. Um, so these are all of our cali these are our calibrations, and then these are some of the samples that we measured. Um, Steve has good hands; um, he gets, you know, we get pretty good good fits to the um, pretty good linear fits. Um, here's some of the details. So we imaged this with Alcyon Blue. Um, um, as far as doing the ELISA characterization, we're basically using antibodies to measure antibody concentrations, and so again, we get decent a decent fit for the calibration curve. Um, um, and so by independently measuring the HA concentration and the antibody concentration, we can come up with this ratio. Okay. So the, the first cytokine that we started targeting was interleukin-1 beta. Um, uh, it's a, um, so in, in immediately following injury, there, we have two cytokines that get upregulated, interleukin-1 beta, and then the other one is tumor necrosis factor alpha. I1 beta is nice to study in the lab because it's small, has a molecular weight of about 17 kilodaltons, um, and it's very soluble, so it doesn't plate out on the sides of your um, of your uh, flat uh, of a, a, a test tube. So um, it's in itself a bona fide tar therapeutic target for a number of conditions. Um, and we had a local expert in Pittsburgh, Mike Lotz, who literally wrote the book on cytokines. He's one of the one of the two editors of the Cytokine Handbook. Um, actually, most he did most of his his work on cytokines on interleukin two as a cancer therapy. Um, but he's a lot of the early w the next work I'll show was actually we've done in collaboration with him. So the first question that we had to ask was if you stick an if you covalently attach an antibody to a huge charged polymer, is the antibody still going to be capable of recognizing the antigen? Um, and so um, there's a slick he has a slick instrument in his lab uh, which basically works like a biocore, um, but it, what it is is it's a fiber optic um, where. Um, um, you can bind antibodies or antibodies conjugated to hyaluronic acid at the end of the fiber optic. And so what you do is you dunk it into a solution that contains the antigen, in this case interleukin-1 beta, and then you pass white light through the fiber optic. So when you get you hit a, a change in refractive index, you get a wavelength dependence in the reflection coefficient going back to the detector. And so you use this to measure changes effectively in, in mass or in refractive index at the interface. And so this is, this, these cur this family of curves are all the hyaluronic acid conjugates and then these are just the bare antibodies. Um, and so uh, what you do is you do the sort of connections to the adsorption and then you take it into a, a buffer solution um, and then it equals, and then you watch the desorption of your, of your antigen into solution and you, you fit with to these uh, to these functions, and you can come up, you get uh, from the fits, you get a K on and a K off, and you take the ratio of those, and that'll give you your KD. Um, so, what we saw was that so. Um, uh, this is the one with the hyaluronic acid, and then this is the bare antibody. And what we see is that the on kinetics are basically the same, and if anything, the off kinetics are actually a little bit slower. Um, and so, what we think is happening is that basically the the antigen is binding the um, is being bound by the antibody, and it, when it forms a long-lived complex, the hyaluronic acid basically reaches around and kind of gives it a hug. And so, by itself, it doesn't really have a strong affinity for um, for IL-1 beta. But if it sits there long enough, it'll, the chain will reach around and and basically help hold it fixed for a little bit longer. But this is basically suggesting these data are basically suggesting that we've got we have we certainly haven't abolished the affinity of the antibody for for these antigens. Um, the catch is that so. 
this is obviously not a natural environment for an antibody to find itself in. Um, and so we wanted to do one more uh, cell-based assay before we move to, um, uh, move to any animal experiments. And so um, uh, our cells are on the lookout, all of our, most of, basically all of our cells are on the lookout for three things, bacterial products, signals from other cells like cytokines, um, and then antigens. Um, and most of these go through similar signaling pathways that, um, that all funnel into um, this what's called the nuclear factor kappa B complex, um, and so usually NF kappa B is held um, in uh, inactive state out here in the cytoplasm. So here's the cell wall, um, the cytoplasm, and then the nucleus. Um, when one of these signals come down, this inhibitory protein gets lopped off, um, and then kappa B complex is the nuclear membrane um, and and activates the um, uh, an inflammatory response. And so, when you ha if you can measure the amount of NF kappa B in the cytoplasm versus what's in the nucleus, um, that gives you the me a measure of sort of an incipient inflammatory response. And so, it, the real inflammatory response hasn't kicked in, but this can be quantified and correlated with with downstream events. The nice thing about it is that this process takes about 30 minutes, um, so it's it's fast. Um, so this is all, these are also experiments we did in, in the Lotz's lab. Um, so this is actually, this, this instrument is called, this is an imaging cytometer. So what it does, it's basically a Zeiss microscope hooked up to a very fast computer. Um, it was developed by a company in Pittsburgh actually called Solomix, um, which was bought by Thermo Fisher. And so what it does, it, so we take, these are, um, these are THP1 macrophages. Um, it's just a macrophage cell line. And we use two stains for the cell. We have a nuclear stain to figure out where the, the nucleus is. Um, and then the green, that's blue, um, is the Herc stain. And then the blue, the green, rather, is um, <clears throat> an antibody stain for NF-kappa B. And so what it does is it will image about 5,000 cells and figure out how much of the NF-kappa B co-localizes in, in the nucleus versus, versus outside of the nucleus. So we get these kind of low, lumpy dose response curves. But if you're out here on the, on the strong response level, it, it becomes relatively quantitative. Um, and you get exciting bar graphs like this out of it. So um, a positive value, so this is a unitless measure of, of the translocation. So positive value implies that the cells are having a strong response and we should see lots of inflammation. And so the cells go bonkers when we feed them LPS, lipopolysaccharide, a bacterial product. And so we see a big translocation value. Um, when we dose them up with 100 nanograms per milliliter of IL-1 beta, we get a lower but measurable positive response. Um, this is actually the um, uh, the control value. So these are the quiescent cells and it's, it's slightly negative. Um, um, we, so what we can do though, we can we show here that with IL-1-beta and hyaluronic acid, we basically get the same response level. So that indicates that it, the HA is not interacting, is not doing anything with, uh, with the IL-1-beta. And then we can knock this back down to, and I, HA on itself has no effect. And then we can knock down these responses to these levels by either treating with antibody alone or with um, antibody conjugated to HA. So we have molecular characterization and cell-based characterization indicating that these constructs are capable of, of neutralizing cytokines. And then we are ready to go well, actually, I was ready to, to publish and get lots of huge grants on this because um, I thought this was great. Um, the uh, reviewers were not so impressed. So they said, show us some animal, animal data. And that, how hard can it be? Um, so um, CMU does not have a central animal facility. There are people that do animal work in their labs, but they do them in their own labs. And so not, you know, being in the chemistry department, I, my lab was not equipped to do animal surgeries. And so um, I have, uh, fortunately, um, uh, Steve Badalak at, at University of Pittsburgh has been very generous in, in helping us with our work. Um, so he's provided access to the um, animal facility and um, this is one of his star graduate student, former graduate students, Tom Gilbert and his, and his family. This is the only, only picture of Tom I could find on the web. So <laughs> don't, don't put your pic picture on the web because I'll find it. Um, but um, so this is Tom who helped us a lot with, uh, with these experiments. Um, and this is our patient. Um, this is a shaved anesthetized rat. Um, the red here is of course uh, antiseptic. Um, so what we're doing in these experiments is we're making four different one centimeter incisions on the back of the rat, on the back of the rat, and then we're tucking. We actually scrape up the fascia a little bit to to induce a little more damage. We tuck in our gels or or, or saline control, um, 
and uh, and then suture it shut. Um, and then usually we'll wait about four days to to get to kind of the, the peak of the inflammatory response right before it starts to su subside. Um, so um, we're going to look at a. We're use a few different markers for looking at, again, macrophage phenotype is going to be the main readout here. Um, so CD68 is a pan-macrophage marker. The M1 phenotype is measured by the expression of CCR7, and M2 is measured by the expression of CD. This is not a brilliant measurement of macrophage phenotype because a lot of macrophages will simultaneously express both of these um, but it, it will at least give us a, a, you know, a semi-quantitative handle on, on um, what the effects of our materials are. So um, the first experiments we did were you know, reasonably high doses of interleukin-1 beta antibody conjugated hyaluronic acid. Um, and so one of these is just a hyaluronic acid control, and then the other one is hyaluronic acid plus, the, plus this antibody. Um, all the little dark circles here are macrophages that, it, um, that stain positively um, uh, for CD68. Um, and, you know, I'm no, I'm no biologist, but between these. And so we did full quantification of all the different immunohistochemical markers, and we still couldn't tell the difference. There was no difference. Um, and so, uh, getting depressed briefly, um, I, we went back and read more about cytokine biology. And so he said, remember, he said that, um, and I you know, show you, they, we really didn't see the difference. Um, 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 Following acute inflammation, there are two cytokines that get upregulated. There's interleukin-1 beta, but there's also tumor necrosis factor alpha. Um, and there's this general principle that any important biological process will have redundancy built in. It's a pretty well You have two parallel signaling systems that play complementary roles. Um, and so um, the nice thing about our approach with these gels is that if we want to just put and we stick it in there with the interleukin-1 beta um, antibody. So when we did that, um, we actually saw very different results. Um, so what happened, so on the left is the site that was treated with um, uh, the gel that contained antibodies again, alpha, and then here's another control. Um, all these little, you see, in deep phages, Invaded the site, um, and we also saw, and I'll show you some quantification in the um, the markers, the the um, uh, phenotype markers that we were looking at. Um, the other thing that was interesting that don't doesn't really come through in this is that when we opened up the site four days after we sutured it, sut, um, it basically looked exactly like it did four days earlier. Um, it we had just completely frozen the inflammatory process. There was a little bit of edema, but otherwise it just, it was like nothing had happened. Whereas this control were all progressing on where there were active tissue, et cetera. Um, and so the, the good news is that materials had an effect, uh, which was nice. Um, we did a lot of quantification um, of, of the, um, of these inflammatory mediators, and so um, the blue one is the, the this pan macrophage marker. Um, so this is N of, so I know some of these error bars are, are overlapping, but um, this is we're at N, N of six for some of these or higher. And so, um, for example, these two wind up being you know significant at least at you know. And, um, but what um, the you know, so what we're seeing here is compared to control the saline control, when you treat with just acid with the arch, uh, an adhesion peptide, you actually have a significant increase in the number of macrophages that have invaded, and that's actually consistent with our understanding of HA as a damage-associated molecular pattern. It's going to start recruiting more inflammatory cells, um, and so when we incorporate these these two anti these two antibodies, what we see is we we drop back down. So it's similar. In the macrophage number is similar to what we saw with saline, but it's 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 sort of in some ways, in, as far as these sort of primitive markers are concerned, it's a significant shift down in um, the number of inf inf uh, mediators of inflammation, and then we're also seeing sh a significant decrease in the fraction that are expressing the marker for the M1 phenotype. Like like gels, it's acute inflammatory um, model are actually having a significant effect. Um, so what we wanted to do is we wanted these 
sort of loose, goopy, gooey gels. And what we wanted to do is have nice, robust you know, biomaterials. And so what we were hoping to be able to do is actually incorporate this, this biological activity into a cross-linked gel matrix. So independently, we've been doing some work on functionalizing hyaluronic acid with a polymerizable methacrylate group, and we can vary all the conditions, um, vary the conditions to get changed the fraction of the monomer to contain this, this group. Um, so basically, you've got these chains with these, with these essentially a vinyl group hanging off the end that you can use a, a radical in, uh, initiator to polymerize. And we can do, you know, this is where all the, my chemistry students get excited. We can do all the NMR to quantify out here in this, um, look at these vinyl peaks. We can quantify, um, you know, the, the degree of methacrylation, et cetera. Uh, Um, 
I'll generate a cytokine and I send it out as a message saying I think there's a problem and if Andreas gets it and agrees with me, he will crank up an inflammatory response as well as send back more cytokines saying, yeah, I agree that there's a problem. And so when you have, um, so the, the, the binding affinity of our, um, of our antibodies for the cytokines is about 100 picomolar, um, whereas most cytokine receptors is actually closer to like 10 picomolar or even one picomolar. So they really bind strongly. And so it's not that there's a, it's not that, that the <coughs> antibody is ripping a cytokine away from the receptor. What we think it is, is basically it's a transport problem where if, it, if we have this sort of retarded diffusion of cytokines from this cell to this cell, they just kind of get hung up in the matrix. It just takes forever for the message to get across. And basically, this whole um, auto, someone out of catalytic inflammatory response kind of dies down. Um, whereas over here, when you can draw a sharp interface between the material and the biology, the shortest diffusion path is between cells up here. Getting down to this gel takes forever. And so if, if, you can, if you can draw a clear interface between your materials and your biology, this approach probably isn't going to work. So what that means is we're now becoming connoisseurs of gluing materials, but they're, they're a little more interesting than you might think. Um, so as far as the, the research part goes, I mean, these are, these are sort of our preliminary conclusions. I mean, we've shown, we think, this is the reverse now, um, that a lot of the, the, the cytokine neutralizing gels um, have um, to be effective in vivo if they're designed properly. The problem from a materials perspective is that the more that you do to the material, the less well it works. It, it, you you uh, inhibit the, uh, the performance. And so um, we're looking at a bunch of different issues here, um, you know, both related to material design, but then also asking the question, well, what if we only neutralize the of alpha and those, those are our goal. Um, I guess I wanted to shift gears at this point and see how we do on time, but the, the questions that we're, we're starting to ask now, in addition to these research questions, are thinking, you know, about, you know, we're using, you know, I'll talk a little bit about market size, but I mean, we're using basically drugs from biotechnology in a biomaterials context. And so, can biomaterials do something to help biotech? And conversely, can biotech help biomaterials? And then also, can we commercialize the results of this research? Um, so, so, I remember I said that when we implanted these gels in this rat model, it, Four days later, it looked like there had been practically no healing. Um, and so you're probably not going to run out to a store to buy a gel that, that shuts down the healing response. Um, but um, there are a number of conditions, like I mentioned at the outset, where we have a very intense inflammatory response that actually either locks the system into a non-healing state or actually makes the damage worse. Um, and it ranges from partial thickness burns to rheumatoid arthritis. And so <coughs> these are all conditions where we think that an approach to, to locally managing inflammation could be quite beneficial. <coughs> so, um, arguably the person that's done in bioengineering has done more to think about sort of commercialization, um, uh, uh, the commercialization process is, is Bob, Lang Bob Langer at MIT. Um, and so, um, so while most of us need 12, a 12-step 12 program, Bob can do it in four. Um, and so this is a sort of glowing article about him that showed up in <coughs> Harvard Business Magazine a few years ago. But his four-step program is a you know, huge idea. Um, I think the, the right order is actually a huge idea, preliminary in vivo experiments, patent it, and then the seminal paper. Um, you don't publish and then patent. Andres can tell you that. Yeah. Um, so, um, you can, but. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so, I mean, in, 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 not to be too cynical, but I mean, in some ways, the seminal paper just turns into free advertising for you. Um, um, but I, I, I saw it. And I think it has other, other rules. So, um, questions, you know, how are we doing? Um, this this stuff, so we did, you know, I did do, well, we'll see if it's a huge idea, but we do have some patents in place now. Um, uh, as you saw in vivo experiments, and then the, pap the papers are, are now coming out. Um, in some ways, I think I may just turn into a cautionary tale for why assistant professors shouldn't worry about IP, but we did it, and I'll tell you about it. So, Here's the lame name of my company. Um, basically, I had a short deadline after to incorporate to apply for some state funds for my um, company, and all the good names have been taken, um, and so I went up coming with this one. So hope, uh, what I'm hoping is that it, it, Washington Therapeutics um, uh, drives some venture capitalists so crazy that they just want to invest in the company so they can change the name. 
Um, and I'd be fine with that. So um, I final, I wanted to tell you a little bit about some of the resources um, at CMU. So in our, our school of business, if you believe entrepreneurship is a specialization like finance or whatever, we're number three here. And it's thanks in large part to um, Irfan, he was a professor there. So he, he was actually then just down here at the bioconference um, that you guys had, that you guys hosted. Um, he teaches a boot camp on biotech commercialization, and at CMU, he teaches a course on basically you know, technology commercialization. At CMU, that's more about like computer stuff. But basically, I, I, went, I was a case study in this where I had a team of, of, um, of MBA students who did market research and actually developed a business plan. Um, and we've also been working a lot with some, uh, an organization called the Pittsburgh Life Sciences Greenhouse. And so in the 80s, the saying goes, basically Pittsburgh ceased to exist because the steel industry crashed. The population was 600,000 in 1978, and last year it was like 350,000. Um, so there was, and there are almost, there's this gap <coughs> in the age demographic where there are very few people between the ages of like 45 and 60 because they all left town, there were no jobs. Um, and so the state and local foundations like the Heinz Foundation, et cetera, got together and, and put together this, um, what's called the greenhouse. And so it's, it's, a, it's a physical, they're in a building, it's a uh, physical organization where they do a lot of things to help promote the formation of new businesses. So um, they'll help you write um, small business uh, proposals, well, business plans, they have what's called an executive and residence program, which is basically people who have real industry experience with Pittsburgh and work with startups. Um, and then also provide like, you with early stage funding. Um, I mean, the, the, the issue with commercialization is that you can do a lot of the seed research here at a university. Um, and if you have an established technology, you know, you, hit, you can hit the growth phase and, and, and get money pretty easily. But there's this gap in the middle where, I mean, for Bob Langer, it's easy, but I mean, if you're Joe the Plumber or me, it's nearly impossible to get money to do this kind of early stage work to really fill in the gaps with your technology. And so that's, that's really where the greenhouse comes in. Um, so um, this is part of a pitch that I give um, related to it, and I figured I'd at least show it. it might be interesting to compare, you know. So, like I was talking with a venture capitalist one time, and it wasn't a formal pitch, but I was talking to him and telling him about what we did. And I started with, you know, extracellular matrix regulates soluble signaling proteins, and I really thought the guy was going to kill me for wasting 30 seconds of his time. Um, so you don't the, the pitches to these to VC guys are very different than they are to the academic community on scientific learning. So um, there are a number of, of inflammatory conditions that have a major impact in our, in our country. So you know, depending on who you ask, a million to upwards of 2.4 million people have diabetic foot ulcers every year. Rheumatoid arthritis affects 1.3 million Americans. 7.5 million have psoriasis. And burns are a smaller, um, definitely a smaller patient pool, but I mean, there are no good treatment for burns, and um, obviously this can have a critical effect on um, quality of life. So in all of these, the central, there's a central mediator of this, which is in, which is implicated in the progression of all these conditions, which is tumor necrosis factor alpha. And so, there are a number of conditions. Um, so Crohn's disease is basically like an inflammatory bowel disease. Um, this is ankylosing spondylitis, is sort of like arthritis of the spine. Um, and TNF-alpha is implicated in all of these, um, and is, is actually used as, inhibitors of TNF-alpha are actually used um, uh, commercially, mm -hmm. or, or clinically, I should say. So, there are, right now, there are basically four different versions of TNF-alpha inhibitors in the market. And so, one of the first ones was actually developed on the basis of some technology that came out of New York University for humanizing antibodies. And so, this is in Fliximab, um, and it's actually, um, the, the, uh, uh, the fab region of the antibody actually recognizes an, um, a murine TNF-alpha, but it has a good cross-reactivity with human. Um, and then it's hooked on to a, um, uh, a human um, uh, uh, concentration. Um, so, so they have different, there are different variations on these. Actually, Abbott, I don't know if you noticed, saw the news, but Abbott actually just lost a settlement to Johnson & Johnson for literally a billion dollars because they had infringed on the method for making a humanized antibody when they developed, um, I can't pronounce this, um, this guy, that one. Yeah, that one. Um, uh, this one, this is from a Belgian company, which is actually just a fragment that's been pegylated. 
So the global sales for TNF alpha inhibitors is 13.5 billion was 13.5 billion dollars last year, um, and so the problem is is that if you're on if you're on these, they're all taken systemically, um, and if you're on these, you get complications due to systemic immunosuppression, which means you, you're susceptible to tuberculosis, you're susceptible to fungal infection, um, and so. You know, these folks are so, were so happy with their TNF alpha inhibitors that they wrote, I'm feeling better on your stomachs. But the reality is that the FDA is actually issuing pretty strong warnings about their use. Um, and so we need a technology to localize the effects of, of TNF alpha inhibitors, and I'm here for that. Um, so uh, probably what I'll do is just go through, um, we're, we are in the process right now, so I have um, an SBIR grant that's starting in January looking at um, um, where we're work, starting to work toward uh, treatments for chronic wounds. Um, but then we're also doing some work with burns and enteritis. Um, so I'll tell you briefly about the burns work. Um, this is also something that the Army is interested in. So the thing with burns is that if you have a partial thickness burn, um, immediately following the thermal injury, you, know, you take the heat off. A, a day, you've got this much dead tissue from the heat. And a day later, what happens is the zone of necrosis is extended further into the viable tissue. And then two days later, it can go even further. And what's happening is the inflammatory response is actually driving tissue down. Um, and so it's nothing, it, it, it doesn't have anything to do with the primary injury. It's your body's response to all this, all this damage. Um, and so we hypothesized that this might be a good condition where if we could take off the dead tissue to get to the viable stuff, put the gel on there, um, what it would do is we could um, shut down a lot of this um, this progression of the inflammatory response, and um, hopefully inhibit some of this um, um, some of this process. So um, we actually did these at the um, the main Army Research Lab down in San Antonio, Texas, um, where we did um, uh, sort of one centimeter um, partial thickness wounds on on rats. Um, so what we so this is a saline control. So this rat basically is getting the kind of treatment that, that I would get if I went to the hospital, which is you know, liberal application of a saline solution and a tegaderm bandage. Um, and so this rat, this lucky rat, um, was treated with our HA antibody conjugate. Um, and it's not showing up great in here, but I mean, what we saw early on was that the tissue just looked pinker and healthier. Um, and Rats will heal wounds to their skin differently than we do. It's mostly through contraction, so they don't need to re-epithelialize. They kind of just scrunch all the tissue together, and so they don't form scars the same. But what we saw was that um, if we look at the size of, of the injury, what we were seeing was around about day seven, there was a uh, significant improvement in, you know, so where the, the average size of these was about 20 or 30 percent smaller than for the control site. The other thing that we saw was that um, so this is this is the date. What it looks like at day two, we've taken off the dead tissue, um, the SCAR, um, and we've, we've applied the gel. You know, we were actually at day one we did that. And we applied the gels. This is what it looks like one day later. This is a little bit of residual gel, whereas this was just the um, um, uh, this was just saline treated. Um, and other at, at these sites, what we're seeing is that so we had this gap in the in the tissue that got burned away. But what we see is that in the saline treated sites. Um, the, the, you start to see the tissue continuing to die as you go further in, and you see all these cracks forming in the tissue, um, it's becoming non-viable. Whereas here in the gels that were treated, the sites that were treated with the antibody gel, um, we have a, um, we've largely inhibited that process and we've just let health So um, we've been working more with the Army on this, and, um, and also, and this is probably the next thing we'd like, what we'd like to be taking into a clinical trial. Um, so these are, this is our sort of to-do list as far as thinking more about the commercialization stuff. So we have the research arm and the commercialization arm. Um, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, I've also been incorporating entrepreneurship into the classroom, um, which I think is an interesting exercise. This is my lovely dean of engineering, um, uh, Reed Kozla, who every 10 years see me renovate its engineering curriculum, and he wants innovation. Um, and so um, Reed, in two minutes, um, Basically, I teach a polymeric biomaterials class, and I used to have the students write term papers, which basically turned into book reports for them. It was boring for them to write, it was boring for me to read. And so what I did 
two years ago was um, I, developed, I replaced it with a team-based project in entrepreneurship where I actually had students during the course develop um, technologies for particular applications related to polymer drawing materials. Um, and so this is, um, these are some of the, uh, some, of the app, some of the ones that they came up with. So uh, kind of two years now, so this is one of them, um, this is one of the better ones in the first year. They, I don't know why they came up with this plan on my name, but um, it's basically a patch that does a stage delivery for um, treating skin cancer. So it releases one agent to kind of break down um, the dermis to allow uh, better penetration of the drug, which gets released later. So it's basically a, a two-stage controlled delivery patch. Um, but the students seem to get into it, um, and it's certainly more interesting for me. Um, so um, basically then what we're, you know, what I've been working on is a sort of integration of our research, commercialization, and also, also the teaching um, aspects of, of you know, where we're incorporating innovation into the curriculum. Um, you know, I guess I wanted to close with this way of thinking about, you know, you know this, there's a, you know, a good question about does this belong at a university? Um, and I think one, one argument in favor of it, um, or two arguments actually are, one is that, that the research and education are always valuable, um, even if the technology flops. And then the other is that, you know, someone in the audience could be sitting there thinking, this guy's a moron for going after cytokines, I would have gone after X. Um, and so, you know, I haven't patented X, so you are free, you know, please don't, you know, please don't uh, work on cytokines, yeah. um, but, uh, but X is open for you. Um, so I just want to close by thanking these folks. Um, um, we have, I've had um, uh, some excellent graduate students in my lab, um, some really wonderful collaborators at the University of Pittsburgh who've been very generous with the resources there. Um, um, uh, folks at CMU Environmental Engineering and Chemistry, um, uh, the, these folks for funding and your attention. So there's a, a treatment for diabetic foot ulcers, so those are non-healing wounds usually on your feet, where they actually treat it with recombinant platelet-derived growth factor, and that's something that was developed by Johnson & Johnson, or these purchased by Johnson and Johnson. But what they found with, with the PDGF therapy was that if you have, that the patient also has cancer, has a tumor, um, the mortality rate was actually significantly higher, and you know they no longer do PDGF therapy for patients who either have you know, diabetic patients who either have cancer or are suspected of having cancer because of it. So if you don't localize the antibodies, if you don't nail them down, they will get into your, your bloodstream and um, the uh, and then you'll start to see all the same systemic effects as you do is just giving yourself the shot of then blah, blah, blah. So we, we think it actually, we're doing those experiments right now where, you know, the head-to-head -head comparison, but everything, the, the few experiments that we've done so far indicate that it's much more effective um, when, when you force the antibodies to Julie. Yeah, hi. Um, thank you for this talk. I was wondering, do you see any change in the cytokine profiles when you deliver these? Um, yeah. In, um, either in vivo or in vitro? That's a great question because, I mean, those are, so TNF-alpha is sort of one of the main, you know, a main upstream regulator of all sorts of other cytokine levels. And so we've done a couple of Luminex experiments. So it, it's basically an array where you can look at actual protein concentrations from fluids that you recover at the injury site. Um, and there's a guy in Pittsburgh named Norm Bordovitz who's really championing this method. And I mean, you know, I was not, let's just say I was not blown away by the quality of the data from our first round with it. Um, do you expect to see the? Uh, we expect to see so it. I mean, part of, part of it is I think 
we made a mistake in that experiment in looking at the four day time point because I think the half life of hyaluronic acid in subcutaneous implantation is about 50 hours. And so at four days, that gel is gone. Um, and so the, the effects of the antibody are, you know, if the antibody is still intact, it's probably gone too. We, we, we think the, the antibodies probably have broken down also by then. But what we're doing now is actually looking at like one or two days because that will give us a much better sense of how all these levels are shifting. The only thing that we saw there was that for some reason interleukin-1 alpha is like through the roof, um, and which I had no idea that the cells were making so much of it, um, and I'm still not convinced that they actually are. Okay, any other questions? When they send out a messenger, are they, is, do they know that the message didn't get to the, to the recipient? And I don't think so, um, um, but I don't know. That's just a hunch. Um, I, I think it partly because of, you know, again, my belief that cytokines are produced with the expectation that the signal will make it. There's, there aren't, for many of these proteins, that just, like we know, we know experimentally that interleukin-1 beta does not interact with collagen at all in type 1 collagen. Just cruises right through, whereas most growth factors get bound up by, you know, certainly the non glycosylated ones stick very strongly to it. So they have like this impulse response and they say, like, we're going to release these for a day or whatever it is. And then right, so, so one, of the, one of the responses to if I get, if, I'm, if, I'm, if I receive a signal from a cytokine, one of my responses is to produce more. And so that's why the profiles of cytokine production actually ramp up. Autocatalytically, because if I get more, if I get the signal, I make more, and then it, it keeps going up and up and up. Is there a negative effect if you're getting less frequency? Yes. Yeah. So if you're not getting those signals, you have no, you know, you're getting signals from the environment that there's a problem, but you're not doing anything. You're, you know, the communication is critical. Yeah. Um, have you tried? Have you tried multiple antibodies? Yeah, so that, that's a good question. So the multiple antibodies, so we know that TNF-alpha and IL-1 beta, the two that are involved in inflammation, we can do those together. We've looked at interleukin-6 in the burn model, and interleukin-6 is kind of simultaneously pro and anti-inflammatory, and that doesn't seem to help healing, and, and we think it might actually burn it. Do you, do you have, are you, you tried to get close? We, don't, we only use monoclonal. Um, if, if the model is correct, if you only are slowing down the transport, the fact that the cytokine, or the, the antibodies are neutralizing shouldn't matter. And so that's another thing that we'd like to test. Any last questions? Do you think that, um, have you started to work on scaling up this process at the beginning you said you make these small amounts? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're looking into bioreactors, et cetera. It's sort of an interesting, it's an interesting bioreactor question because the viscosity of a, of a polymer with molecular weight a million increases exponentially as you increase concentration. And what about the antibody uh, quality? You know, is it possible for it to be great in natural processes? That's okay. No, they're pretty tough. Um, the antibodies, if we're, we, we did a lot of work in, so we do like, ammonium sulfate precipitation, we don't let them see acetone or other solvents like that. And so um, the inter one thing, one nice thing about NF-kappa B transformation <coughs> is it, it's a great measure for biocompatibility. And so when we had a less than rigorous purification prep, we actually saw pretty high translocation just you know from our goo. And so we, we knew that we weren't done with purification until we got that back down to the Okay, please join me on thanking you all.